better things to do to um, tonight, like, I don't know, uh, get herself uh, unpacked because she just moved really in September. So for those of you who are um, on this Zoom, thank you so much for joining us. And again, this will be recorded. So you'll have an opportunity to review the uh, presentation as well later if you wanted to and share with some of your other camp fellows. Uh, but Dr. Rafi Shashadri, she just, as I said, arrived um, and she's going to be a research scientist at the new use, or I keep saying UC Davis, but a new USDA ARS research laboratory at Davis. And um, some of you who have taken classes with us at the Laidlaw facility probably have noticed some of the uh, trailers as you turn left to go towards the facility, that's where Dr. Sashadri is. She's in those trailers together with her colleague, Dr. Julia Fine. Um, and I think it's gonna be a great collaboration. Both of them, as I said, just started. I think Arafi uh, arrived September 1st or something like that, right? And yeah, Julia, so mm -hmm. yeah, Julia was there since June or July, I can't remember exactly. So we're really excited to have them join sort of this B group that we have at UC Davis. Um, and she will be talking to us today about bees and flowers and the plant, presumably plants that bees need and uh, plant compounds also uh, that are produced that bees can benefit from. So I'm going to Turn it over to Arathi and she will tell you about her research. And thank you, Arathi, for taking the time to join us also. Sure, yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Alina. Um, and thanks for having me here, Wendy. So hopefully um, everybody can see this. And I'm expecting that the questions are going to be at the end. So please um, make a note uh, of the questions. So uh, before I kind of get started, um, I want to also um, say thanks to everybody here for being here on the, uh, in the evening. Uh, hopefully you will enjoy some of the material that I want to share with you and uh, uh, learn something. A little about myself, I have an undergrad uh, in horticulture and a master's in plant breeding and genetics, which is where I kind of got into the evolutionary biology and the evolutionary interactions and how uh, why plants do a lot of things they do, very simple questions like why do they make so many flowers when there are so few fruits on the tree? Um, so those are some of the questions that I explored during my master's, trying to understand the evolutionary basis for plant behavior and uh, plant reproductive strategies. And for my PhD, I went on to work uh, with uh, Dr. Gadakar, who is a social insect biologist working on um, wasps and trying to understand social evolution. So he's also an evolutionary biologist. And the other why question I explored there was uh, understanding why animals live in groups. So why do we have these large colonies of um, insects with one queen and so many workers? What makes these workers uh, give up their own reproduction and work for the queen? So um, those are some of the questions I explored in my PhD, but I got a really good training in insect behavior um, at that point and uh, understanding how to measure behavior, how to analyze behavioral traits. Um, and then I came to, uh, for a postdoc to the University of Minnesota to work with uh, Dr. Marla Spivak, which is where I got all my training, my introduction and my training into honeybees was in Marla's lab um, where I was studying hygienic behavior. So the reason she hired me was I had good behavioral training and she wanted somebody to study hygienic behavior and explain the behavioral patterns. So, so that's where I got into honeybees. And at that point, and moving on forward, I've been wanting to tie my experience with plants um, and then understand what bees do, why they do uh, the kind of things, why, why is their behavior like the way it is. So what I'm gonna do today is I will talk a little bit about this connection. Uh, so my title is um, Bees and Flowers Are Entangled Forever. So if you're looking for healthy bees, uh, you need to have healthy plants. So I'll give you some examples of how this interaction may come together and how can we think about improving and strengthening um, bee colonies and uh, pollinators in general. So a lot of what I would say today may seem like I'm talking about honeybees, but one thing we all need to keep in mind is 
um, they're all bees. And so when we experiment on honeybees and find some things, more or less these are uh, pretty well applicable to all the other bee species. So um, that's my message. Yes, we use bees, but I think it's, uh, you, can, you can very easily replace pollinators because most of our findings will apply to all pollinators. So as Elena said, I've just joined USDA um, and I will be in that near the bee lab area. So please feel free to come and stop by and say hello. Um, best way to reach me is my email. Um, I, right now there's like a ton of email there, but I promise I will get to you um, if you reply to me by email. We don't have working phones, so actually email is the best way to reach us. So getting into the talk that I put together for today, I'm talking about bees and flowers and I'm saying that these are entangled forever. So let's see what this connection is. So if you think about what the bees are doing and where do the plants and the bees come together, this is a nice little um, graphic that my grad student, uh, who's now an extension agent in Colorado, put together when she uh, was talking to her citizen scientist. So what exactly do bees do in the environment? They go from flower to flower and collecting pollen and nectar. And when they look at, let's say they go into this flower on the right and find that the pollen is very tasty. There's a lot of, or the pollen is, there's a lot of pollen, the nectar is very tasty. So they have learned the, uh, what the flower looks like, what the flower smells like, what is the color of the flower. And they go about looking for the same flower in the environment because now they know that they get good food, tasty food. And so they go to another flower of the same kind which would happen to be the flower of the same species. And when they're doing that, the pollen that's on their body will get moved from one flower to the next. And this pollen is actually the male, uh, the sperm in plants. And when pollen moves from one flower to the other, uh, it leads to what we call as pollination and fertilization. And this process of pollination and fertilization is, is essential for seeds to develop, for fruits to develop. So, when you are eating a seed that could be like a bean seed or anything else, or we are eating fruits, keep in mind that this process of pollination is essential for the plants to reproduce. If we don't have this, we won't have seeds and we won't have fruits. So this is what the bees are doing. They're going about learning the color of flowers, learning the shape of flowers, and then visiting flowers on the, of the same kind. And in some sense, providing what we call as a service for plants. So this process of pollination where these insects, um, mostly the bees and the butterflies and the birds, uh, birds are not insects, sorry. Um, the insects are actually unintentionally moving pollen. They don't know they're actually performing the process of pollination. All they're looking for is food. They're trying to find nectar. They're trying to find pollen because this is what they're going to be feeding their um, young ones. While what they're doing is a service for the plants. They're helping the plants reproduce. Plants are staying in one place, they cannot move around, but the bees are carrying their pollen around. So in order to get the service, in order to make sure that the bees stay attracted and uh, focused on their job, what the flowers are doing is in some sense paying these pollinators for their service. The flowers are giving them nectar, they're giving them pollen. The flowers manipulate this whole pollen and nectar thing quite a bit to keep the uh, bees motivated. There are some flowers that will replenish their nectar so that uh, when the bees come back next time, there is more nectar in the flowers. Uh, some plants actually release pollen sequentially. So every time a pollinator comes in, there is some pollen left for the pollinator. So there are various ways in which plants are uh, working with the pollinators. But what to keep in mind is that that nectar and pollen is actually the payment that the bees receive from the plants for the service that is carrying the pollen to another plant and providing this pollination and uh, allowing the plants to reproduce. So this is the connection that we have between the plants and the insects. And this evolution is, is several million years old and it has evolved when bees evolved from wasps and became vegetarian. Wasps are carnivorous, bees are not carnivorous. They depend on plants uh, for nectar and pollen. And their evolution coincided with the evolution of flowering plants. The flowering plants came about on this planet and alongside what we see is an evolution of bees and uh, the bee pollination. So that's a very interesting topic that I'm not going to go into the details today, but I will uh, kind of tell you a little bit of examples because this evolutionary relationship between plants and their pollinators dates back several million years ago, but it also continues to evolve. 
So the plants are continuing evolving strategies to attract pollinators, to improve cross-pollination, and the pollinators are learning. So there's a lot of cognitive performances in pollinators that allow them to learn plant strategies and to take advantage of that. So the pollinators can learn, they can remember, they choose, and they also have very strong preferences of what they like and what they don't like, um, and they remember that. So all of these things actually feed into this relationship of coevolution, uh, making this or strengthening this connection between plants and the, uh, and the bees and the pollinators. So if we look at this connection and see a few examples of it, when you look closely at a flower, if you haven't already seen this, the next time you're looking at a flower uh, or you're walking through a garden, just look very closely at the flower and you will see that the flowers have a lot of different things on their uh, on, the, on the, the floral parts, the very attractive floral parts that are there. The reproductive parts are buried somewhere inside that we won't very easily see. But if you look at the petals of the flowers, they, are, they have a certain shape and they have certain things on their petals. So if you look very closely at this full flower, this is a mimulus or a monkey flower. And what you see here in the bottom is what we're calling as a landing pad. And that is, if you imagine a bee that is flying in and is flying in really at a high speed and it has to get into this flower. So it's almost like a little landing pad for your aircrafts or a landing path that we have in the airport for the aircrafts. And if you watch bumblebees on this flower, they will land somewhere around this area and then manage to crawl into the, um, into the flower. They will go to the center of the flower and to find nectar and pollen. So we did some studies where we uh, gave the bumblebees um, flowers where we had removed the landing pad. And what happens then is that the bees come in and they cannot land on the flower. They just struggle to get into the flower and uh, eventually make their way to the flower, but then they don't come back because it's a lot of effort going into the flower trying to find it because it's not um, easy to find the entrance to the flower without that landing pad. So a lot of flowers have this landing pad. Here is Mimulus. If you think about a lot of the mint flowers, they are small, yes, but they still have a landing pad. Foxglove, um, many of the flowers that we see around us have these landing pads. And if you go even more close and look at the petals, you see these little tiny hairs on the petals. A lot of flowers have these hairs and these hairs, what we figured out was actually, are actually pollen traps. So when the bee comes into the flower, it is probably in contact with the flower for 30 seconds, maybe a minute or a minute and a half when it's collecting pollen. But that instant when the bee comes into the flower and actually the pollen that's on its body is depositing on the flower is for a very short period. So the plant is trying to make the most of that small uh, you know, time of contact. And what these hairs will do is improve uh, their ability, improve the plant's ability to trap the pollen that's on the body of the bee. So when the bee leaves, if you take this uh, petal and actually put it under the microscope, you will see lots of hundreds and hundreds of pollen grains uh, trapped on this petal. And when the flower starts to wilt, some of the pollen grains from this petal will actually get onto the female part of the flower and kind of increase the probability or increase the amount of cross-pollination that is happening. So this is another strategy by which the plants are making them make, are trying to improve on uh, their relationship with the bees. The bees are coming in, let's get the most of, off of their body as we can um, so that uh, later on we can actually improve the amount of cross-pollination that happens. So this is an example of landing pad and, um, and um, hairs on the corolla that act as pollen traps. The other thing that you have are all the signs that are there on the body of the flower. So if you look at this kind of, uh, of the flower here, there are lots of signs on this plant, on this flower. And you, if you, have you ever thought about why are all these the designs over there? No, the flowers were not made for us. They were, uh, they have evolved for the bees. So it's not like the flower is trying to be pretty for humans. The flower is trying to communicate some sort of a message to the bees. So it's almost like you walk into the mall and you want to find the candy store. I know none of us want to do that, but let's say that you want to find the candy store. This acts as, an, as, a, as a direction, as a map for the bee saying, okay, here's where you can find nectar. So these nectar guides, as what we call them, actually indicate to the bee where the nectar is present in the flower. So they're almost like this uh, graphic here shows it's a sign telling the bee that that is where the nectar is. And as soon as you land on this landing pad, you should uh, start following these nectar guides and you will find the nectar. 
Um, and so these are UV reflecting and I'll show you that in a little bit. In addition, the center of the flower, which is where the nectar is, is slightly warmer in temperature. Anybody that knows insects know that um, insects like warm temperature. So they will land on the flower, follow the nectar guide and sort of home in on this center of the flower, which is slightly warmer, and then immediately they will find the nectar. So here is where they're almost talking with each other, saying, okay, this is how you go, this is where you find the reward in the flower. So there is a lot of work done on honeybees um, and a lot of bees in general. One thing we all have come to appreciate right now is what we see is not what the bees see. So here is the human vision that goes from ultraviolet, which we cannot see starting, uh, but the visible wavelength, that is the white light, starts from violet and goes all the way to red. And that's what we can see. But if you see the bottom panel here, this is what the bees can see. As you see, the bees are a little bit more displaced. They can actually see in the ultraviolet spectrum, but are not very good in the uh, red area. So they cannot see red very well, but they can see ultraviolet, which basically means that they can see things that we cannot see. And that, that really makes this whole relationship very special because a lot of flowers that don't look very pretty or look very boring to humans can be very, um, can be very pretty for the bees. So here is bindweed, which I'm sure any gardener does not like bindweed, but look at the flowers of bindweed, the way they appear to us, which is on the top, and what the bee sees them as. If bindweed, if this is what we were seeing, I'm sure we would all think this is a very pretty flower and we would let the plant be. But we are going to be looking at this plain white flower. Uh, and that's why it's not interesting. But for the bee, uh, it's bright red in the center and it also contrasts the, neck, the pollen with the red and it allows the bee to actually work into the flower and find the nectar. Here's a geranium and I was talking about those nectar guides. Those nectar guides are also reflecting UV light. And so this geranium flower for the bee, this is what it's seeing it as. Um, a very stark contrast between white petals and red, red nectar guides. And that's kind of what makes it easy for the bee to actually um, find the nectar and the pollen in the flowers. Uh, I did mention that the bees cannot see red per se but they can actually differentiate red between anything else in the background. So if you have a plant that is green, uh, that has green leaves and red flowers, it can, the bees can differentiate the red from the green and they will forage on flowers, but they don't do as well uh, on red flowers as they would on other flowers. So there is a little bit of a compromise, but they learn, they learn how to deal with this thing. On the other hand, what I usually tell people is, uh, look at the green on the leaf of the bindweed and see what it's looking like here when you have a UV filter on, it's almost dark gray. So when you have only green, it appears gray for the bees. So if all you have is lawn in your backyard, it's almost like concrete for your bees, for the bees that are flying through. So there's really nothing there. They don't see any color. They are just looking at green. Green might be very pleasing to us, but it really does nothing to the bees. So we have to somehow keep in mind when you're designing gardens, when you're planting flowers, when you're designing experiments that you wanna be able to understand what the bees are seeing, what they're thinking. And so some of these things actually help us in planning what uh, we need to do and what we can do to help the bees. So if you're driving through, you wanna stop for a you know, drink or get something to eat. Uh, and if you don't have anything, it's, it's, it's almost like that for a bee. When it's flying through areas where there are only lawn, it's almost like the driving, the driving through Utah for the most part, where you don't even have anything. It's just a desert. There's not even like a McDonald's over there to stop and get something to eat. So that's pretty much what it's like. So one, one thing to try break up your lawn and plant some flowers and um, increase diversity in your lawn for the bees. So this is kind of the uh, morphological relationship that the flowers have with the bees. Um, one thing that I am interested in, so I have, I have done some good amount of work on these kinds of things where we have looked at the flower characteristics, the flower color and how they interact with the bees, what makes the bees learn, uh, what colors do they like and those kinds of questions. But now I'm moving on to something even more because what I think is if plants and bees have co-evolved, their co-evolutionary relationship should move even beyond just the flower color and flower smell. We keep talking about humans are what they eat. Uh, this is also very much true for bees. Bees are what they eat. So if we want to have healthy bees, in my thinking, we also need to have, uh, give them healthy food. So let's see what, uh, what we have here. 
So when we are looking at Honeybee Health, this is a little flowchart that always is shared with people. Um, honeybee Health depends on environmental stressors. It depends on the pests and pathogens that are attacking the bees. It also depends on the genetic diversity and vitality. To me, when I look at this flowchart, yes, it was published back in 2010, um, but it feels like there's a big aspect missing here, and that is plants. When you're talking about honeybee health, you really need to be talking about plants because they contribute to honeybee nutrition. They, they are the direct contribution to honeybee health because they provide the food for the honeybees. And then the plants themselves are affected by all of these other factors. They are the pl plants are affected by environmental stressors, the plants are affected by pests and pathogens, and they have different genetic diversity and vitality, which makes them different. It's not like we can take it for granted and say, okay, the plants are there and they're giving the bees food. No, the plants are affected by all of these other factors and what bees get depends on what's happening with the plants. So with this in mind, we actually did a study um, back in Colorado in 2015, where we wanted to see what is the role of the drought stress in plants on honeybees. So we set up these huge one acre canola plots, um, one which was uh, which received no supplemental irrigation and eastern Colorado is a dry land if you don't um, irrigate these plants supplementally. And the irrigated plot had uh, irrigation provided at 2.5 centimeters per week. And you can see very quickly the difference. The inset here shows the plant at flowering. Um, in an irrigated field, there are a lot more flowers and in a drought stress field, first of all, there are not enough plants and then each plant has very few flowers. So right away, when you look at a plot that is not irrigated or a plant that is experiencing stress, when a plant is experiencing stress, it pulls down the investment that it makes in reproduction. It does not have the resources to produce offspring, so it does not make flowers. So we look very closely and what you're looking at here, first of all, in a drought stress field, the open bars here are drought stressed and the closed bar are the irrigated uh, field the number of plants are higher per, per uh, unit square. And the number of flowers open on a given day is also much higher in an irrigated flower plant. And or the number of pollen grains produced uh, per, per flower is also very, very different. So if you look at the pollen production per flower, when a plant is, so we counted the number of pollen in um, drought stress flowers and in uh, irrigated flowers. And what you find is a 17% decrease in the amount of pollen grains produced by the plant. The plant is suffering. The plant does not have enough resources. It is not going to be able to invest in reproduction. So this is a very direct indicator to what the bees are getting when we have ongoing drought stress in our environment they don't have enough food available in the plants because the plants are pulling back uh, and not making pollen grains. Um, so we also had bee colonies uh, situated right next to these canola fields. So as the canola was flowering, we set up pollen traps just to measure the amount of pollen that the bees were bringing in. About 70% of the bees that are placed near canola fields go into the canola uh, fields and forage on canola. And you can see here, the drought, the colonies near the drought stress field had about a third of pollen coming in. Canola is a huge pollen producer. Beekeepers love to put their hives on canola because they come back rich in pollen. But if your field is drought stressed, they're not getting enough pollen. So very simply, drought stress plants are not making enough uh, pollen grains. They're not producing enough flowers. So directly in terms of the quantity of nutrients, they are impacting your bees because they're not giving them enough nutrition. Um, bees have to fly farther, they have to look at more things to find that. We also um, uh, analyzed the nutrient content of the pollen grain to see whether there was any difference. And yes, drought stress does alter the nutrient content. We did a metabolomic analysis and I'm not going to go into the details of the analysis. One thing you wanna look at here, and it's very, very clear to see, the green dots here represent the chemicals that were found in irrigated, uh, in pollen from irrigated plants. And the yellow dots are in the are chemicals that were found in the um, pollen from drought stress plants. And they're distinctly different. So they're not overlapping a lot at all. There are some nutrients missing in either of these things, especially lipids and secondary metabolites are not found in the drought stress plants. 
Um, so also they differ in sugars. There is a clear uh, separation of what might be there. And when we looked at what is in the green that is missing in the drought stress plants, a lot of sugars and amino acids such as glutamine were missing in the drought stress plants. Again, telling us that nutrition is not, nutrients in the pollen is not uniform when the plants are stressed. Um, you may all know this, pollen is very, very important for the bees. They require about uh, 26 teaspoons of pollen to raise one healthy bee. And they collect about 20 kilograms of pollen uh, over a year through the season. So we, they really need pollen. And uh, there have been, they also need nectar. Nectar is important for surviving the winter, especially in the Northern United States and a lot of those areas where you have snow and cold. They require about a hundred pounds of honey going into the winter in order to make it through and come back alive out of the, in March next year. So nectar is essential for honeybees to survive. One of the studies done by um, Schofield and Methrilla a few years ago actually shows that when worker bees are deprived of pollen or their pollen stressed, they are not able to do a lot of different behaviors. Uh, pollen stress can happen in so many different ways because of seasonal pollen flow being different, loss of foraging habitat, intensive management that you have for a lot of agricultural land. So pollen stress is very common in the environment, especially when you're looking at bees. And when you have pollen stressed colonies, uh, these colonies make fewer foragers, which means there's going to be lesser amount of food coming into the colony. Um, stressed colonies start foraging early, which means that the bees forage earlier than their 21 to 24 days, which is a normal foraging age. And they're not really ready to forage. So when they start foraging earlier, they're going to be less, less successful. They start dying even within one day after foraging. So all of these things kind of build up in this colony. And as, a, you, as the deprivation of pollen continues, this colony is going to start suffering from long-term um, symptoms. And one of that is the ability of nurse bees to care for the developing brood is compromised. So what you see is over time, the colony gradually weakens. And at some point you're going to reach a, there is no way out point and the colony is going to die. So pollen not being available for the colony can impact very, very seriously in many different ways. So they cannot waggle dance well, which means they come back and they give wrong directions to their nest mates. And those bees go out completely flying in the long, wrong direction, they're not gonna find food. So in every which way, the behavior of the colony is compromised, leading to an eventual colony failure just because they don't have the right kinds of food available. So why, if you think about what is happening in the environment, the access to healthy nutrition is highly restrictive in the environment. Um, another study that was done uh, by Nag, who's actually my husband, he was working on these kinds of uh, studies back in 2009. He used secondary data to show that uh, between 1980 to 2005, there was a distinct decrease in the open lands. Open lands are qualified by rangelands, prairies, all of these things. This is USDA data. And also what you can see at the same point in time is increased in developed lands, which could be housing, malls, um, parking lots, any of these things are all classified into developed lands. And in, in conjunction with this, what you're looking at is when there is a decrease in open area, there is also a subsequent increase in bee colony losses. So if you take all of this together, it's a fairly simple way to say that when there is changing land use patterns, uh, decrease in open lands could lead to um, uh, honeybee colony losses, of the loss in habitat. When we're looking at the stressors, here are all the things that they talk about. Um, genetics, the fact that honeybees were introduced from Europe, it's a small founding population. There is a strong selection in Northern United States for overwintering colonies. We have intensively managed colonies. The thing we are going to focus on is looking at nutrition, um, habitat degradation, in intensive agriculture. So these are the questions we are going to look at. And anything up in the top three bullets is going to directly lead you into susceptibility to diseases and parasites and chemicals and pesticides. When you have a weak physiology, you are going to be susceptible to a lot of different stresses that are out there in the environment. So bees are experiencing a lot of stresses, right? I mean, come November, you will start seeing a lot of bees coming into California for uh, almond pollination. Um, you also will be looking at a lot of monocultures and then there is urbanization. So there is a lot of things that lead, uh, there are a lot of things that are leading to imbalanced diets in the bees. So here is monoculture and intensive agriculture. This is corn 
And here are leafy green vegetables. Yes, we are trying to eat healthy, which means that there is an increase in salad kind of plants, which don't give anything to the bees. And then we have canola. This is, these are our fields um, and pay attention to this little green strip and I'll talk about it. This is our canola field in full bloom. And four weeks later, this is what it looks like. Uh, Bharati, if you can hear me, your video is frozen. The habitats are flowering. Oh, there you go. And what it's doing is it's giving bees continuous source of nutrition. Even though canola is done flowering, um, there are other plants in the area that are continuing to provide nutrition. Uh, we also analyze the pollen. What we find is differences in the pollen nutrient content when it comes from canola or when it comes from white flowers. So we need all of them together if you want to make sure that the bee has a good nutritional source. Um, when we look at plant impacts on nutrition, we are all aware of floral nectar, that is carbohydrate, and pollen, that is the protein source. So what I am interested in is looking at what else does the pollen and the nectar have? And then you come across with this term called secondary metabolites or phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are produced in really small quantities by plants and they're used by plants for defending themselves. Remember the plants are standing in one place, they're rooted to one place, they need to fight against herbivores and a lot of other pests and they have come up with these different ways to defend themselves. They are these chemicals that we are aware are useful for human health. So there are phenolics, there are alkaloids, there are non-protein amino acids. All of these are beneficial to human health and what I'm interested in looking at is how does this impact um, honeybee health. There are studies that are shown that these chemicals are actually very important in plant bee communications. Uh, Wright and others in the University of Exeter in the UK actually showed that caffeine, which is a very important phytochemical, improves memory retention. So when bees are trained for a certain order, they can remember well if that training is supplemented with caffeine in the environment. So it actually helps them remember. They go back where, where they want to go back and forage and those kinds of things. So there are these uh, literature that is showing that these secondary metabolites are useful. So we went back and we looked at our canola plants and our white flower plants to look at one particular chemical called picomeric acid, which has been shown to upregulate detoxification and immunity genes. And so we just looked at, okay, what is the amount of... Um, picomeric acid found or the precursor of picomeric acid found in canola and found in wildflowers. So you see the difference. This is what is coming into the beehive. Very, I mean, very small amounts are coming in when the canola is flowering, but in the wildflower pollen, there is a lot more of that picomeric acid plant, about 300 times more uh, of the precursor to picomeric acid present in the wildflower um, pollen which is itself telling you that white flower is a diverse pollen mixture, so it is bringing in a lot of diverse nutrients. Your canola is a monoculture, it's not giving uh, enough nutrients to the bees. So based on this kind of a preliminary result, we wrote up a proposal to Project APSM um, the last time that they were funding, and one of the things that we are looking, we were looking at is the impact of dietary uh, supplementation with phytochemicals to understand how it impacts worker longevity, pathogen tolerance, and also the gut microbiome of the bees. The goal here was for us to develop some sort of a management tool. Can we provide honeybees with some sort of supplements that will improve their health and productivity? So we've uh, tested four different chemicals. Um, caffeine, which was already known to promote learning. Uh, picomeric acid, again, known to improve gene, uh, gene expression and two other uh, chemicals which sort of were, so this camphorol is a similar in structure to picomeric acid, and gallic acid is a flavonol. We just thought, okay, we'll try one more different chemical and tried these four different chemicals. Before we came to this, we had tried a, a lot of different kinds of things, and these were the four that showed us some sort of promising results, and so we ended up with these four. Um, we tested several different doses, but what we find, the benefits are mostly at the low doses of 25 ppm, which actually makes sense because that's what is found in nectar. Uh, the nectar concentrations are anywhere between 25 ppm or lower. 
So the higher you go, these chemicals can also act as toxins for the bees. So our experimental methods, um, we would color mark about 800 bees on uh, the day of emergence. Here's what we did. We gave them a little dot on the thorax. Here's all, and then we would release all of these bees into foster colonies, let them sort of intermingle with the other adults in the colony, go back uh, eight days later and capture uh, all the eight to 10 day old bees. So here's what we would do. We would open up the hive and look for these marked bees. And that used to be a lot of fun. So here's all the, uh, the arrows show you the marked bees. So we would pick them up, put them in a cage, bring them back to the lab, um, kind of cool them off a little bit to sort of knock them out and then put them into what we call as these cup cages. About 10 bees per cup cage um, were transferred into this. And then the syringe that you see on the top would contain the phytochemical in 20% sucrose. And these bees were allowed to feed on it. Uh, we monitored the longevity of the bees. So every day we would count how many bees died and kept the bees going, I mean, kept the experiment going uh, for a long period of time, uh, for as long as all the bees died. So here's the data. Uh, one thing is this black line here in the middle is the control when it, the bees were just fed with sucrose solution and no phytochemical. Uh, as you can see, the blue lines here are the most relevant ones because that is the 25 ppm. And caffeine uh, promotes longevity quite a bit. Bees lived about 40 days. Uh, gallic acid was more useful in the middle concentration of 20, 250 ppm. Uh, the thing to note with caffeine is very high concentrations were actually toxic and the bees would die much more quickly than they did with the uh, under control conditions. Camphorol uh, was beneficial at very high concentrations. This is something that we are still trying to understand. Uh, picomeric acid was beneficial across the board. This is a chemical that we know is actually extremely beneficial for the bees. So this was uh, kind of good for us to see that longevity is improved. And then we went on um, to actually look at um, pathogen tolerance. We tried, we worked with Nozema and what we did was took the Nozema spores and infected these eight to 10 day old bees. We brought back those marked bees like I showed you before and then fed them with two microliters of spore inoculum. So basically in two microliters, we knew how many spores are going to be there. Uh, it was previously determined. And we actually took pipettes and held the bees as shown here and fed them. So we actually made them sick and then transferred them to those cup cages. Um, after that, we gave them phytochemicals and 20% sucrose. So it's like testing whether these phytochemicals actually help the bees fight this infection that we have given them. We monitored longevity. And when the bees died, we actually collected the dead bees and counted the number of spores that are there in their body. So to see what did they do? Did they detoxify the spores? Did the infection build up? What happened? Um, so once again, here, this black line shows you the control bees, the infection in the control bees, which basically remained or actually remained that where it was. It was not detoxified. The control bees had about 870,000 spores um, per, uh, per sample. But what was interesting was caffeine at low concentrations was able to decrease the spore load. The bees that died uh, under low doses of caffeine were able to detoxify that chemical quite, or, or the infection quite a bit. And um, this was really very promising. And this is also true with camphorol in low concentrations and picumeric acid in, low in pretty much all the concentrations. So this is where we are at right now. Phytochemicals in low concentrations actually help reduce the spore load uh, in infected bees. Higher concentrations are not beneficial. And that's something um, that we kind of can appreciate and understand because these chemicals are plant defense chemicals. So the question here that came to our mind is when we are looking at it, you don't see a zero spore load. You see a decreased spore load. You don't see that the bees were able to completely um, clear themselves of the infection. So the question is that can these bees with really low spore loads actually now transmit the pathogen? Are they going to still be infective or how does this work? Because these phytochemicals didn't clean them. Uh, they just reduced the spore load. So other studies have actually shown that when the bees are starved and infected, they are more likely to transmit infection. This is because starving bees are likely to go and solve all this said, they're going to beg for food from their nestmates when they're hungry and they're starved. And if they're also infected, that begging can lead to transmission of disease. 
So our hope is that if bees are able to access phytochemicals in floral nectar, when they're consuming the nectar, they're not going to have the starvation risk. And so if they have these phytochemicals in nectar, then they're likely to um, have lower risk of starvation and be less likely to actually transmit disease. So phytochemicals are important, but phytochemicals in, in, in nectar are necessary for the benefits. And these phytochemicals are actually toxins that the plants have produced to defend themselves. So, um, and we know this from several other studies on bumblebees and kind of some of them that are coming up in honeybees, they have this connection with the plant. So we need to be really careful because these are plant defense chemicals and high doses can actually kill the bees. So we have to work out these doses and the doses very, very carefully. Uh, we also know in some of the citizen science studies that my student is doing uh, in Colorado that honeybees have very strong preferences. If you watch them in your yard where you have a lot of different flowers, they don't forage very uniformly. They will forage on certain flowers. Here you're looking at honeybees foraging mostly on the purple cone flower. Even though all of the other flowers were present and were present in the same numbers, they still went preferentially to um, purple cone flowers or this uh, butterfly plant here, the uh, caryophyllus. So they show these kinds of preferences. We still don't understand what those preferences are based upon. How do we connect it to the needs of the plants? Sorry, the bees. So in terms of my ongoing projects right now, uh, I've been working with Colorado beekeepers and we are analyzing the nutritional profile of their colonies. Uh, I'm also doing some lab experiments where we are looking at the effect of phytochemicals on pesticide detoxification and how these phytochemicals can help bees survive um, pesticide exposure. Uh, these are the preliminary data that we have. We work with one migratory beekeeper who brought his colonies out to California and three local stationary beekeepers in Colorado. Uh, I hope to continue this study in California and I was just talking with Elena about this last week. We would like to actually collect the pollen and honey um, and assay them. And the goal is to actually see whether we can develop some sort of a nutritional profile of colonies. Um, and this is what we are looking at. This is a very preliminary data because this analysis is taking a long time. So what you're looking at, so caffeine has still not been analyzed, but the gallic acid, camphorol, and uh, picumic acid, you see that there is some seasonal variation. So this is the early season, the hash graphs. Um, they're pretty high in gallic acid, and I'll show you at the end which may be the flowers that contribute to this. Apples and a lot of those plants have, are high in gallic acid. But as the season progresses, you start seeing a decrease in gallic acid. Camphorol, on the other hand, is very high in sunflower. Towards the end of the season, you'll start seeing um, sunflower pollen, uh, sunflower coming into bloom, and also the uh, canola uh, or the uh, camphorol content increasing in the pollen. So we know a little bit, but we still do not know everything that the bees need. We also don't know everything that the plants contain. So there's a lot of work still to be done. So I plan to continue to analyze these and also want to perform some supplement trials in real colonies, kind of take those case results and trans translate them into colony level studies to see what the benefits might be. Um, we are also looking at the effect of these phytochemicals on the gut microbiome. And here, my hope is to build that into behavioral expression, specifically hygienic behavior, and also learning and memory. How do these chemicals impact the different cognitive processes in honeybees? Um, and how do these phytochemicals help queen performance? These are some of the studies that I will be starting in the coming years. One of the bigger questions for me that is really interesting is what is the phytochemical profile of the bee preferred flowers? We are all planting pollinator habitats. Do we know what these flowers contain? We really don't know. So one of the questions that we want to follow is assaying the pollen in the plants to see what do these pollen contain? So that when you come to me and say, hey, what do I plant? I can tell you here's a good mix of plants, not this, it looks pretty. It also provides nutrition for the bees. Uh, so that's one of the longer term goals of my research where I'm able to say that for a healthy diet, here are all the things that we need to plant in the environment. So a lot of this study, I'd like to acknowledge the research team that I was working with in Colorado State. Uh, Elisa, Biostad, these are the two chemical ecologists, Drew Barnard, who is my husband, who also works a lot with honeybees learning and those kinds of stuff. 
Um, three of my students who contributed a lot to this. Uh, the fourth one that's not here is she's not a student anymore. Um, Elisa Mason, who's an extension agent that has done a lot of the citizen science work. Uh, my work funding came from Pollinator Partnership, Project APSM, and we finally were awarded a huge grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research to actually explore the phytochemical basis of honeybee health. Um, and I'd also like to thank USDA for giving me this opportunity to grow this research into a larger project. So before I end, I want to leave the last slide. Um, I'll say thank you, I'll come back to this slide, but I also want you guys to know that there is not a lot of information on the pollen and nectar composition of flowers. But for the four chemicals that we are working with, here's what you can see. Caffeine is found in coffee and citrus. Uh, gallic acid is really found, found in a lot of different kinds of plants like strawberries and blackberries and apples. Keep in mind, this is not looking at pollen and nectar. This is just basically looking at plant tissue. And I just have it listed here because I think that if it is found in plant tissue, there's a fair chance that it will be found in nectar and pollen as well. Uh, camphorol is found in apples, um, tomatoes and onions and squashes. So a lot of your um, vegetables have it. Picumic acid, uh, there is a reason why beekeepers like sweet clover. Picumic acid uh, is very high in sweet clover and sunflower, uh, sweet grass and all of those kinds of things. So sweet clover and the bees become healthy when they forage on sweet clover because they kind of really get pumped up on picumic acid. Um, so yeah, sweet clover is a big noxious weed, which is always a problem when you're talking with landowners, but hey, it has benefits for the bees. So with this, I want to say thank you to all of you for patiently listening to me, and I'm happy. Um, if there's a way to take questions, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much, so much. Appreciate it. Um, Alina had to step out for a quick moment. I'm yeah. back. Oh, good. Okay, so I'll <laughs> hand it over to Alina. Uh, yes, thank you, Arathi. Uh, that was great. I'm excited to see how we can collaborate further on this. Definitely some of the questions with Queens. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions of those who are present here? I have a couple of questions. Sure. Obviously, always questions. <laughs> so how do you see this um, being incorporated into the beekeepers management? Are the phytochemicals? Yeah, phytochemicals, are they something that you would be incorporating into already existing feed? Would that be possible? Yeah, that is one of the things, that is one of the first studies that I want to do, basically. Um, so everybody is feeding sugar syrup at some time or another, right? And so if we can determine good dosages um, that can go into the sugar syrup, then that is something that we can tell the beekeepers that, hey, here is the season when bees are not going to be getting these chemicals. So maybe this is something that you could add to the sugar syrup that you make at home. Um, so I, I think that is one way to go rather than adding it with the mega B or any of the pollen supplements because we still don't understand how they interact with the other chemicals that are there in mm -hmm. pollen supplements and things. But sugar syrup, that's what we are testing with, right? And so yeah. uh, we know that there's not a lot of interactions over there. So my first goal here would be to actually do those colony level assays and find uh, doses that are actually going to be beneficial for uh, bees at the in the colony, so we can actually develop a profile for a feeding profile for the bees. For the bees, and so also I think. Oh shoot! I totally lost my train of thought right now. Uh, was it the mega bee? No, actually, it wasn't the mega bee. It was another, um, I guess, similar question. Oh. I was also going to mention um, to our master beekeepers who are present on the phone call and hopefully the rest who will be watching the video is that Zarathi mentioned she will be collecting samples uh, of pollen. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we can piggyback or we are going to do pollen collections as well in collaboration with Neil. So hopefully we can do a joint collection of pollen. But um, our interest is in looking what the pesticide loads are in pollen that the bees are being exposed to. So I know that you're already doing a little bit of work on this, but can you talk a little bit about how this might help with pesticide exposure in bees? 
Yeah, so that's something that we, I just got the data from the lab in Colorado where it, this past summer, uh, the experiment we did was expose the bees to neonics um, in the form of, I mean, neonics in uh, sugar syrup and then give them phytochemicals to see whether they were able to detoxify the phytochemicals. So that data I still have to analyze, but we have some data on that. This other study that Julia and I just set up last week here in Davis is basically looking at the same thing where we are now giving these little bees, the bees that just emerged, we are giving them phytochemicals and we are giving them neonics or the imidacloprid in the cages. And we're going to be seeing how, whether the bees are going to be choosing and how does they, how, do, how long do they live? So we're kind of trying to uh, take this protocol that I have here and kind of merge it with Julia's protocol. And the mm -hmm. hope is that uh, we will then also, we don't have live queens in her study yet in the one that we just set up, but the hope is that once we have this figured out, we can actually look at how uh, these might actually help the queen because Julia studies are showing that uh, pesticide exposure is going to impact the queen. Mm -hmm. But what we hope is that these phytochemicals, if we can help show that, yeah, the phytochemicals in the diet can actually bring down the negative impact of uh, pesticides on the queen performance, then again, there is another reason why giving phytochemical supplemented sugar solution can be beneficial. So I have two sets. I mean, one data is still to come, another data, data that is sitting in my inbox, uh, where we might actually be able to show some impact of these phytochemicals on, phyto, uh, on pesticide detox. Yeah, there, there, there is going to be some connection and I hope that there is some natural way in which we can actually build this uh, phytochemical uh, availability so that the bees can actually help themselves by feeding on this variety and uh, phytochemicals. So. Okay, and then so you said you will be looking at um, phytochemical profiles of different plants, are you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's a hope. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully you'll be here for a while, so <laughs> plenty of time. I'll find somebody that's going to do it, yeah, like yeah. a student yeah. or somebody, yeah. Um, so do you have an idea of which plants you would want to focus on, maybe, now that you're in California? Yeah, so I was going to talk with Neil and you guys to see what, what is being planted in pollinated habitats here. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of go from there as a starting point. But definitely, for example, we can, I can start with the monocultures. Like I can start with almonds. I have some idea okay. of canola. I can start with uh, sunflowers. So we can start with the agricultural plants and then build on that because there at least we know that getting the amounts of pollen we'll need for the analysis is not that difficult. But mm -hmm. the pollinator habitats, I mean, the, the reason I said I hope so is because um, plants, I mean, the getting the amount of pollen we need for this analysis from plants is really challenging. We have to go there before the bees get there. Um, and then we have to be able to get a lot of flowers. So I still yeah. haven't kind of come up with a good protocol. We could start with the monocultures that are here um, in terms of the agricultural plants and then kind of look at the very commonly grown pollinator habitat plants um, and then build on that. That's what I had planned in Colorado, but Colorado doesn't have many uh, uh, monocrops that are bee dependent while Col uh, California does. So we okay. can start a combination of both. So I'm also, I know that um, it would probably be of interest to many folks who are not necessarily beekeepers, but would want to plant for bees. We have yeah. Christine Casey has the project where she's evaluating various plants, similar to what you were talking about with your right. students in the garden. So I think that might be an interesting um, right. area of yeah. further exploration because mm -hmm. this would be something that the uh, gardeners can just grow in their backyard. Um, so it would be more urban rather than agriculture yeah. or we could yeah then we would have both so that would be good i see madison is yeah, a both unit. actually yeah. madison do you have a question i do i do um hi uh, dr rathi i'm kathy madison um and i just we've planted uh, intentionally barrage throughout the garden it does well uh but then we also planted mushrooms and sunflowers mm -hmm. uh, throughout and have had our neighbors do the same thing so there's a little bit of a a stream or a, a flow a river of plants so cool. 
the, the, what I'm asking is though, is that I don't see any bees going to the sunflowers, just butterflies and bumblebees, but they love the mushrooms. So it's kind of <laughs> odd to me that they just sit on them. And I mean, I guess they're kind of moist, but is there something in the mushroom that they're, they're kind of going for? Because, and should I be planting more of those? I mean, we live in the city, so it's kind of foggy and uh, we're, it's much easier to grow that than a, the sunflowers. Yeah, I mean, one thing with the bees that we are, I mean, I'm still working with this data on my, with my student is that, yeah, this is, I mean, you're looking at sunflowers and mushrooms, but it's also that uh, you might have a lot of different kinds of plants. The bees will only forage on some. It's not like they'll never go to sunflower. It's just that you've given them a choice of two things and they want one over the other. Okay. Um, it could also mean what, be dependent on what their colony needs at that given point. But with mushrooms, I don't want to say a lot, but there are some uh, people in Washington, in the state of Washington that are looking at some of the compounds in mushrooms that are supposed to be beneficial to the bees. And these are not university researchers, so I don't know exactly what they're doing because it's a little bit more proprietary information. But there are some chemicals apparently in uh, mushrooms that are, uh, or in fungi and mushrooms that are going to be helpful for the bees. I do not know. This is not a very scientific, this is not a published study. So I don't want to say too much about it. But uh, in terms of them not going to sunflower, but going to something else, all I can say is that um, it's also not that you're watching them every second of the day. When you see them, they may not be there, but it could just be that they might show up at another time when you're not there. The That's bees true. are. Yeah. At any given point, I think there are over 2,500 bees per colony that are out there foraging. So you see a small fraction in your yard and that, that doesn't really depict everything that's going on. So I wouldn't remove the sunflowers from there because I know sunflowers do provide a lot of important nutrition for the bees. But yeah, why are they not going there? That is not something that I can, you know, quickly answer. That's, well, I, don't, I, I, I didn't that. answer your question, but I... No, you did. It's good. I, um, we do have a nanny cam on it, so we were, we were a little okay, bit... Okay, so you have been collecting data. That would be interesting. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, but um, uh, my second question is probably not related, but do... Uh, did the number of hairs on the bee, is that a, a something that is genetic and that you can... Uh, so that they can have more hairs on them. It, does, is there some colonies that have, have, or types of bees that have more hairs where they collect it faster or better in the flowers than other bees? Yeah, I mean, I, Elena, feel free to jump in if you know more about this. A lot of, I mean, most of all the traits have a genetic basis. I think uh, age of the bee is also going to decide how many hairs are there on the bee in addition to diseases and other kind of pesticide exposure and those kinds of things that make the bees almost bald and everything. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are very few traits in bees that have been selected for and bred. So I'm not sure if there is anyone has even looked for like more hairs on bees and kind of gone into the breeding of it. Elena, do you want to jump in with this? I would love to, but I have no more to add other than the fact <laughs> that okay. Um, other than the fact that different types of bees, different species seem to have different numbers of hairs. So for example, like the one that comes to mind right away is the carpenter bee versus mm -hmm. bumblebee, right? The carpenter bees tend to be pretty bald um, compared right, to yeah. the bumblebees. So, but I'm not certain if people have looked at exactly what that purpose is. I mean, carpenter bees go into the wood, right? They burrow buried yeah. out into the woods so it might not be great to have all those hairs whereas bumblebees I, yeah I live underground and they do but they both pollinate so I'm not sure um, if yeah, they pollinate different those, flowers. Um, I can also see that the carpenter bees are a little bit more tropical where bumblebees are adapted to alpine conditions so it also kind of keeps them allows them to forage in cooler temperatures so yeah, um, that's yeah, true. those kinds of across species, there are some studies, but um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sure. Anybody else? John or Joan? Uh, yeah, I actually, this is Joan, and I actually have a couple of questions. Um, one, how much forage would one need to help? provide the phytochemicals for just one healthy hive, like a 40,000 beehive? Yeah, um, that's a great question. First of all, um, 
I don't know all the chemicals that borage has. And uh, even with, without looking at that, I think there have been studies that are shown that a healthy hive requires about three acres of flowering habitat, uh, continuously flowering habitat. And uh, borage is good, but again, I wouldn't go all, I mean, I wouldn't go all out for borage because again, they need diversity. So, um, I mean, first of all, I think if you have one hive, I don't think we have three acres of flowering habitat around that hive, do we? Uh, that's always the problem that, um, you know, when we have hives, do we don't think about how much um, area they need. So, yeah, you might plant as much borage as you can, but uh, I feel like more diverse pollen that flowers throughout the season and those kinds of things that I didn't really talk about a lot is also going to be important. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still learning about the California phenology, so I don't know how long the flowering season lasts in terms of borage flowering and things. And I most of the time think like in terms of Colorado, which is not relevant here, the flowering season is very, very short. Um, so I would say that, yeah, plant as much as you can, but also try to include diversity of uh, flowering plants in your yard. Right. Well, where I have my colonies is in a vineyard and mm -hmm. it's 200 acres. Okay. So uh, what we typically do is we start to see middle of October okay. and uh, we do pretty diverse amount of uh, seeding uh, various plants. Okay. Um, but you know, one of the things that when you were talking about collecting pollen of particular plants, um, in the Sonoma Valley where I keep my bees, a lot of vineyards just plant, um, uh, wild mus mustard mm. and huge amounts of acreage of wild mustard yeah uh, I, I guess it's a bit of an invasive yeah uh, i was gonna say is it easy to grow yeah yeah once you get it it doesn't go away <laughs> right so, it spreads and it reseeds very easily I yeah mean, one thing i can say when you have such a large area and this is a study that we are still doing in colorado but just knowing bee foraging behavior and the kind of um, preferences they have and the abilities that they have is um you know, rather than mixing, like rather than planting a pollinator mix, I would suggest that you plant strips of uh, each species that you're planting. So even if you can uh, make whatever large strips that you can, so the bees like to specialize on a certain kind of flower. So they don't like to keep switching between sunflower and borage and mint. I mean, it's, they don't do it. At any given point in time, their brains can handle two kinds of flowers. So when they come to borage, they want to stay on borage. When they go to sunflower, they want to stay on sunflower because that is kind of more efficient for them. They don't have to keep modifying their behavior to collect pollen, learning new techniques and that kind of stuff like that. So I would say whether it's your garden or whether it's your uh, pollinator habitat in your field, try to plant strips of one species and then kind of a strip of another species it is easy for you to maintain because all of these plants are of the same kind and also it's nice for the bee. So then when you have these large acreages, yes, you can have one acre or three acres of borage and three acres of sunflower. I mean, you could do something like that when you have these large acreages. So I am trying to tell people to plant strips rather than planting pollinator mixes, which completely throws the bee off. I mean, it's just like very confusing for this little bee to go about each time trying to learn a new flower and manipulate a new flower. If you kind of see where I'm coming from, um, they perform better and they are more efficient when you give them a few kinds of flowers. So planting them in strips is actually maybe one thing that you can do um, in your large acres that you have. That's a great idea and I'll pass that along to the people that are actually doing this work. Yeah, so that would be something that, like I'm saying, we're still waiting for data, but just knowing the literature and just kind of understanding how bees work, my prediction would be that their efficiency would be better when we have strips rather than mixed um, species package. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joan. Todd, do you have a question? 
No, I do not. Okay, and then I see John is also, John Johnson is also unmuted. Do you have a question, John? John might be having problems with his microphone, Alina. Uh, let's see, how about a chat? Where's John? I will ask him on a chat. If he sees it. But while we're waiting, um, if anybody else or nobody else has any questions, I think we will just thank Arathi for joining us. This is really very useful to me and very interesting. And I know it's been of interest to uh, many beekeepers and gardeners too, to learn more about the relationship between plants and bees and how we can promote bee health using um, various plants. So that's great. Well, thanks. No, I didn't hear. I didn't hear from John, so I'm going to go ahead and say we're going to be closing out the webinar. And again, thank you all for joining us, and especially thank you, Rossi, for uh, being here with us tonight. Yes, yeah. Thanks for brilliant. having me. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Alina. Thank and thank you. Absolutely. Everybody. And as you heard, Rossi at the beginning said, if you have any questions, you can email her, and she's here now at Davis, so it'll be easy to get a hold of her. I hope. For yeah, stop by. Thank you, very much. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, have a good evening, everybody. You yes. too. Have a great week. Good night, yeah, everyone. Good Take night. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.